but let's start with constituency parsing. Right. So analyzing sentence structure is going to be a really important baseline for many things, building new sentences, understanding the semanticity of the sentences, etc. And so we've been focusing everything so far on the word level. So we've been identifying words, identifying their parts of speech, their word meaning using WordNet, or a little bit of their phrase structure using named entity recognition. Well, from that, we are going to move up now to sentence structure, which thinks it allows us to think about different inherent problems in human language. So two big issues. First, ambiguity. Most sentences are, well not most, many sentences can be ambiguous in nature. And that's a problem with polysemy, right? So many words have many different meanings. That's a lot of many's in one sentence, but you get the idea that some words have multiple meanings and it could be difficult to parse which one is the correct one. There's also the problem of creativity. So amb ambiguity also um, can happen when you are referring to things in previous sentences. So using pronouns or ambiguous references. So you don't know what object you're referring to. So I used to, my advisor in grad school used to underline every time I said this verb um, because I didn't have a noun, right? So if I said, this can get us going, you'd be like, this what can get us going, right? So that is an example of a different type of syntax ambiguity, right? Where the referent isn't clear. Uh, another issue with parsing systems is creativity. So that's the great thing about human language is that we're very creative. But I've given this lecture like mm, 3,700 times at this point, and I've probably said it a different way each time. How do we write systems that are flexible enough to deal with creativity? So the whole goal here is going to be to figure out how we can use grammar and syntax to parse a bunch of different types of sentences without it failing. And you'll see that that's actually quite difficult. How do we represent the structure of sentences? Just first of all, this is going to be in constituency format. And then how do we automatically parse sentences and understand those constituencies? And then a, a last question that's not really about parse trees, but is dependency parsing. So what if you're interested instead on how the objects depend on each other instead of their syntax tree relationship? So there's kind of two big fields in when it comes to parsing. And we're gonna do constituency parsing this week and dependency parsing next week. Okay. So let me just give you some examples to help solidify why parsing is difficult, right? So Usain Bolt broke the 100 meter record. Fair enough, right? The Jamaica Observer reported that he broke the record. Okay. Andre said, the Jamaica Observer said. I think that Andre said that the Jamaica Observer reported that. So we could build these sort of nested sentences. They all have the same meaning, basically, that he broke this record because he's a very fast man. But what we're doing is modifying where we learned that meaning from. Okay. So they all have say the same semantic meaning, but they're creative in the sense that they're written or uttered differently. So we had to find a system that can handle both the original sentence and all of its modifications. Okay. So this shows us a template, at least in English, of how we might combine sentences. Now, this lecture is going to be about English in English. However, Many languages follow this pattern of subject verb object and language combinations with coordinating or subjective conjunctions, sub subordinating conjunctions, subconjunctions, whatever they are. Um, so this isn't an English specific lecture, but it, there are obviously exceptions in other languages. Another issue that uh, sentences have is this idea of recursion. So this is from Winnie the Pooh, right? And it's why the first sentence here is in um, square brackets, just to give you a little bit of context, but look how long, this is one sentence. <laughs> and it's one impossible sentence. So one thing to remember is that when, you're, when, when you are writing for humans to read, 
these kinds of very long nested recursive sentences are not very readable for humans, much less computers. And so you should avoid doing this sort of thing. Um, one and is probably enough. <laughs> so if you look uh, at the sentence as I am blathering on here, you'll see that there are a lot of ands, that's, buts, which is, so things that combine sentences together. It's perfectly legal, although maybe not so interpretable. The fact that we can do this is called recursion. So recursion is a concept of com com combining smaller sentences using this idea of S sentence, but sentence, when sentence, which sentence, that sentence. So we have these words that allow us to combine sen entire sentences together. Okay. So this is called recursion. We could create endlessly long sentences. You should not, but you could. So how should we define a grammar? Grammar is the thing that translates the sentences into a structure, either form, dependency, or constituency parsing. So how do we like translate syntax and, and grammar into structure? Okay. So grammar is that system or structure, but how do we write it in a way that computers understand it is what I'm trying to say. Okay. That structure is what actually helps us translate things into meaning. So English and many other languages, word order is the largest cue for meaning. And so um, if you understand the word order in a sentence, you usually understand what's going on. Then you add on top of that, the pulling information from memory, that background information. So much like we last week used WordNet to pull the definitions of words, you're mentally doing something similar where you're pulling word definitions, Based on the syntax, the constraints are applied. So um, I think I've talked about kicking the moon before. One does not kick the moon, so you get very confused because the word order says that is what you're kicking, right? And the semantics pulled from memory says, wait, kicking and moon don't seem to go together. And so there's a lot of different processes going on, um, but uh, the main gist is that we're using the structure of the language to help provide constraints and understanding how those meaning object meaning of each definition of the word relates and builds this larger mental model. So this is a really famous series by Walter Kinch on how we do this, where we're pulling these inferences from memory. So if you run into a word you've never seen, it's really hard because you don't have anywhere to pull information from. But translating that into a system that's workable on a computer, it's our target here. And so one system that's very popular is called constituency parsing, where you build these parse trees. And so if there's a structure and an order, we should be able to break it down and give them labels. So much like our entity parsing, where we pulled out chunks of the sentence, now we're breaking the sentences into chunks. And so this is a, another uh, kind of NLTK famous example, where we have the entire sentence, Sentences are broken down into noun phrases and verb phrases. Okay, noun phrase, the head of the phrase, the begin, not the beginning, but the important part of the phrase is a noun. Verb phrase, the first part, the important parts of the verb. You may have called this um, uh, predicates kind of breakdowns, subject predicate breakdowns, and that's more English version. <laughs> so the noun phrase, uh, verb phrase. Okay. Noun phrases have a noun at least. Maybe some other words. Verb phrases, however, can be a lot of things. They can be a verb and a whole nother sentence. So you start to see how we can break them down. So the verb phrase here turns into another sentence. Sentence is gonna have a noun phrase and a verb phrase. That verb phrase turns into verbs and another sentence. If we have recursion, we might not have recursion though. So this starts to allow us to see that structure. Um, and many, many, much of this research is based on Chomsky, who's the father of a sort of modern linguistics. And the idea was that we are born understanding grammar. We don't understand language and the words and the symbols themselves don't really matter. What we are understand, what the brain can handle here um, is the grammar part. And there is some support for this. Babies seem to understand grammar, which is a little surprising, right? And there's a whole other set of theory, th people and theories that argue that tabula rasa, 
that we're born as a blank slate and we learn grammar because of statistical learning property, properties. So you hear it enough that you begin to understand the patterns. So we are good at innately picking out patterns. And some reality is somewhere probably in the middle, but there do appear to be genes and, and protein something or another's in the brain that process grammar. Okay, so there's a lot of cool research on FOXP2, which um, shows that without that, you have trouble creating and understanding grammar. Uh, and then if you do research on on Williams and or Down syndrome, you can see differences in the grammatical abilities there as well. So clearly there's something programmed in up here. And so we have a system, learned or not, that allows us to create these grammatical phrases. Okay? So language is just a bunch of grammatical combinations that we put words into. So it's just a bunch of like, here's a combination, plug in a word, right? Now, verb, adverb, adjective. Okay? And grammar is the, the combinations that are valid or the rules that allow for combinations to generate these sentences. And so generative grammar is this idea that we have these rules and we just generate sentences on top of that. Okay. Meaning or semantics, understanding, summaries, right? Mental models, making a picture of what's happening is built from these parts of these sentences. Adding to background information. Because I think you can't ignore the influence of your environment to your understanding, right? So for example, if you're talking to me about football, I'm most definitely gonna be thinking about American football, even though that word clearly has uh, a different meaning in Europe. It's mostly about what, as an American, I would call soccer, right? Silly example, but that meaning is pulled from the literal part of the sentence of where it is, and um, but also my environment, my understanding of that word. So that leads me nicely into ambiguity. Okay? So ambiguity can be caused by polysemy. It can be caused by structural pro a structural reference in the sentence. Right. If I said this allows us to move on, you said what allows us to move on. OK, so those are two different problems. But then there's another type of ambiguity that is perfectly valid sentences that it's not clear where they, the items relate to each other. OK, so very famous sentence. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. This is a Groucho Marx joke. So the question is, how do we parse this sentence? Most of you are like, this is not a confusing sentence at all, <laughs> but hold on. Okay. How do we create a structure, structural tree of the grammar in this sentence? Because that will determine the interpretation of the sentence. Okay. So you could say, I shot an elephant. You can take the in my pajamas. This is a prepositional phrase. It's a modifying phrase you can stick it to modifying the noun. I am in my pajamas and I am doing the shooting. Or you can stick it to modifying that second noun, elephant. So the elephant is in the pajamas, which is a little silly, we're not children, but it is actually a perfectly valid way to interpret the sentence because the prepositional phrase, it isn't clear which noun it is modifying. Right? So who's in the pajamas, me or the elephant? Okay, most of us as adults go, me. Okay, Because we're taking our understanding of word meaning and combining that with the sentence structure. So here's the sentence structure. This is an ambiguous phrase. Where does it go? Well, I understand the way the world works. And so I'm going to stick it with I because people wear pajamas, not elephants. Okay, if you're a child, you don't have to do it that way. You can do sometimes what's called minimal attachment where you take a prepositional phrase and you stick it to the closest noun possible. Okay. Um, and that would be elephant. So the elephant would be in the pajamas. So they, you have to understand, like there's a lot of processes going on that aren't just noun, verb, noun, verb, plug and, plug and go. Okay. So this brings us me back to this idea of grammatical slots. There are certain words that go in certain places to create grammatically correct sentences. So there are specific combinations that can happen based on what's already previous, 
you know, we previously have built. Now as a human, I'm processing as I go along. As a computer, it probably takes the whole sentence at once. So humans are sort of faster <laughs> at going, wait a second, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. So we could understand sentence structure and therefore build our own sentences by looking at bigrams, pairs of words at a time. So can I generate valid sentences if I simply look at all the possible pairs of words combinations and randomly select? Okay. This is a bit what people think Google does sometimes <laughs> because it's a hidden Markov model. Best guess is they don't tell people, um, which works very similar to that. So based on the current input, it predicts what word should be next. Okay. For a long time, it probably was pairs of words at once, but now it's probably way more complex than that because it'll do whole phrases for you. But if it doesn't know, the best guess is the most likely word pair from the previous word. Okay. So if I take a large set of text from an LTK and build a bunch of diagrams, so let's count the word, you know, the frequency of pairs. So it would be create some, some sentences, sentences from, that kind of thing. And then recombined them with the same um, grammatical structure, right, as before. <laughs> so it's the same, um, same nouns, verbs, preposition structure, but now is a different pair of bigrams. Do they make any sense? So, no. <laughs> so he roared with me, the pale slipped down his back. Okay, this is um, a sentence that has is perfectly grammatical, but makes no sense semantically. Okay, the worst and clumsy looking for whoever heard light, also perfectly grammatical, but does not make a lot of sense. So I'm really just trying to highlight here that syntax is not the only answer. We can create perfectly perfectly grammatical sentences, syntax that matches another sentence that makes sense. However, the word choice is still important okay? and our understanding of semantics is still important. So you can't have syntax without semantics and you can't have semantics without syntax. Well, I guess you can't have semantics without syntax. Like if I give you a single word, you can tell me what it means, but you can't create these big pictures without syntax. Okay. So, this whole idea is tied to a very famous sentence, a second very famous sentence, which is colorless green ideas sleep furiously, right? So adjective, adjective, noun, verb, adverb. Perfectly grammatical sentence, don't make a lick of sense. Okay. Sometimes these sentences are called word salad sentences because they are syntactically correct, but do not actually mean anything. Okay. Um, and so the, I, the, the understanding here is that we have to account for, get to hear my dryer. <laughs> it sings to you. I should put this in as a random question for my quizzes to see if students have watched the video. What happened in the middle? The dryer sang its song. Dear Samsung, cut the length of that nonsense. Awesome, okay, back to this idea. So sometimes this is called word salad, moving on from that. So the basic gist here is that maybe there's some rules, other rules than just here's a valid order of words, right? So sometimes they're the va they're a valid order of words, but maybe there's some other like structural things going on. And sometimes this is called coordinate structure. So if phrase one and phrase two are both grammatical category, phrases of category X, like noun phrases, verb phrases, adjective phrases, then these two phrases together are a category of X. So essentially this is a really fancy way of saying that your outfit needs to match. <laughs> so it, both pieces need to be black or both pieces need to be blue. Otherwise that mixing and matching is the problem. So let's go back to our example. The book's ending was the worst part and the best part for me is the original sentence before we played with our bigrams. Okay. The worst part and the best part are both noun phrases. So they coordinate, they match. So it's a valid combination, like semantically. This is noun phrase plus noun phrase, so it makes sense. 
On land, they are slow and clumsy looking. Both of these are adjective phrases. Okay, slow and clumsy looking. So adjective phrase plus adjective phrase, makes sense. When we combine them together, the worst part and clumsy looking, that's when it all goes to heck, right? So it is true that we could combine a noun phrase and an adjective phrase, that's perfectly valid. In this case, because of where we've placed it, it doesn't make sense. So the, the phrase is structure when we start to recombine objects do have to match. Okay. So we can do noun phrases and adjective phrases in the same sentence, usually separated by a verb. So that leads me into what we're really going to cover today, which is constituency parsing. Constituency parsing is making these trees. Okay, it's the fancy phrase for building these trees. Now remember that constituents is a fancy word for an object that rests in a larger object. So I'm a constituent in my parish because I live in Louisiana and you can't um, name anything the same as anybody else, but I'm a constituent in my county, if you will. Right? Um, so it does have this like politics thing, but a constituent in this case is each word in a phrase and each phrase in a sentence. So the immediate constituents of a sentence usually are a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So that's always the first place we look to break things down. From there, we can break things into noun phrases into their parts, determinants. And in this case, um, it says nom, which is a funny word for nominative phrase, which is essentially another little noun phrase. That noun phrase is an adjective and a noun or nominal phrase sometimes. Verb phrases can break down into pretty much anything. So in this particular case, it's another verb phrase, right? With a verb and a noun phrase uh, and a prepositional phrase, okay? Which is attached to this verb phrase. So you never thought such a short little sentence that makes sense. The bear saw the fine fat trout in the brook was so complicated, right? But the nice thing about these trees is not only do they tell us where things are modifying each other, okay, which we'll do more in dependency parsing. That's the point of dependency parsing. But also tells you how complex the sentence is. So by counting how many levels there are, one, two, three, four, five, six deep, one, two, three, four, five, six deep, okay, completely. That's so you can measure how many. Uh, how deep a sentence goes and compare it to other sentences to see which ones are more complex and difficult to understand because the more the deeper it goes <laughs> the more complex it is to understand you could count the number of phrases so in this case there there are you know there's only one verb but there's multiple verb phrases so we can start to begin to understand that this is the actor the action and where the action is taking place, that kind of thing. Um, so there are many parts here that we can begin to pull out to process or interpret. Now, sometimes this is called contract, contrax, <laughs> y'all, context-free grammar. It's called context-free grammar because it does not take into account the context of the sentence, but especially not things like tense or number subject verb agreement. So I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks. This third person thing in English is so weird. So it doesn't account for any of those um, conjugation rules or little matchy things that we need to do in syntax, but just takes into account the sort of broader context of nouns and verbs. Okay. So you can create context-dependent grammars. Uh, we mostly won't get into those, but this type of constituency parsing is called context-free grammar. So it's a set of recursive or iterative rules that are used to either break down or generate sentences. You can go either way. Okay. And we're gonna look at doing this in NLTK. Um, I think Spacey will do this, but we're mostly gonna use Spacey to talk about dependency parsing, which is way more popular right now. Okay, but you can't understand dependency parsing without understanding constituency parsing because most dependency parsers actually run constituency parsing first and then just translate. So they're actually doing this and then they have a little set of rules that take it from tree 
to dependency parsing. That'll make more sense next week when we actually get into what the heck dependency parsing is. And so if a sentence can be parsed with two or more structures because there are multiple interpretation ways of where to attach, especially preposition phrases, they're considered ambiguous. And so this kind of marker would allow you to rewrite a sentence. So things like Grammarly that tell you like, well, this is bad grammar. Part of what they're doing is looking at these sorts of rules. So how do we do this? Well, for example, if you see an S that implies it's the entire sentence. So we always, we could start with a full sentence and break down, or we could uh, build up to the full sentence. We'll talk about both directions here. Noun phrases, which are generally a noun determinant, maybe an adjective, right? The noun is the important part. A verb phrase, which is a verb and maybe a whole nother sentence. So verb phrases are kind of like verb and everything else <laughs> at the beginning. So verb phrases are definitely the most complex things that we break down, or they could just be a verb. Okay. Prepositional phrases, things with, in, above, on. A determiner. So we're now down into just the weeds of the part of speech tagging. So back to why do I have to learn this part of speech tagging thing? Can't create a noun phrase if you don't know what a noun is. So that's why it's important. Noun, verb, preposition, and all the other ones that we've talked about. So we'll use all of those, um, mostly in the universal part of speech tagging system. But here, uh, mostly we're going to focus right now on noun phrases and verb phrases, because that's the general kind of breakdown that people use. Okay. So parsing, which is what this entire lecture is about, or creating a parser, is where we simply take sentences and put them into this, this structure. Okay. So constituency parsing or context-free grammar parsing, whichever phrase you like better, is building them into those trees. So compare that to what we've done so far. We've tokenized, right? Breaking, word, breaking a sentence down into its uh, words. We've tagged with part of speech tagging. We have not gotten a classification quite yet, but tagging and tokenizing are technically classification questions. And we've also chunked. That's what any R taggers do, is build chunks. Okay. So parsers are these interpretations of some defined grammar. And you can write your own grammar, although I would argue that, that, that many people have done a lot of work in this area and they've figured this out. <laughs> so I'm not sure that I think that writing our own grammars any more useful in the sense that there's, there's a large amount of work here and they're pretty good. So just like with part of speech taggers, like training your own would be really useful if you have a, fan, if you have a, a set of data that doesn't conform to the normal rules or has a lot of slang. But what I would do is start with a basic part of, like a pre-built part of speech tagger and add to it. I would probably do the same here if necessary. Okay. So this is true in English. I don't know how true this is in every language actually, but parsers are pretty good. Okay. And they're built to search through all the possible combinations of parse trees and match it to the current sentence. So given our grammar that somebody wrote, I used to have lectures on how to write these and it's awful. <laughs> it is straight awful. You will realize like how complex syntax actually is if you try to capture all of the different possible combinations that we use. There, there's a lot of them. Um, and, but many languages are subject verb object, which is what English is. And so, as it, you know, syntax doesn't care what the symbols are. So we have a good base because many languages follow these same rules, right? Um, and then we could evaluate in the same way we've been doing, right? So checking a correct answer and seeing if we're getting it right. All right. So the goal of parsers theoretically is to represent what people are doing when we process a sentence. So here's the tree that they, this person would have built on this sentence. So their interpretation of the sentence would be X, Y, and Z, because here's how that sentence breaks down, right? So we know that people would interpret elephant 
the the pajamas are on the person because we put that prepositional phrase with the first noun. And so a parser practically breaks down sentences, but that potentially its use could be to, um, to in question and answer type systems like Siri. And if you can break sentences down, you can build them back up. And so using, um, using the idea of this is what a, a proper sentence looks like, you can begin to start to figure out what words to plug into those holes. So let's focus on two types of processors here. Um, the first one is gonna be recursive descent parsing, which to me just sounds like cave diving, but um, the simplest way is to uh, take the entire sentence and then break it down. So you take out, you grab the entire sentence as your big goal, find S, which is the whole big sentence. From that, break it into noun phrase and verb phrase, because every sentence has a noun phrase and verb phrase. Even if it's something like pass the salt, there is an implied noun there, you. So every sentence has this, a noun phrase and a verb phrase, even if it's implied. From there, are there more noun phrases and verb phrases to break down? So keep breaking down the noun phrase and verb phrase until you end up with what's called the head. The head is where the noun is the leftmost object in a, in a part of the tree. So a noun phrase, uh, you know, I have the determiner and then another little noun phrase, but you find the noun phrase, the noun, and then you break down the verb phrase side until the verb is the leftmost object. So this is considered a top-down parser. Top-down parsers use a grammar to predict what the input might be. And so by it's top-down because it takes the whole sentence and breaks it down into its parts. Okay. A bottom-up parser takes each word one at a time and then combines them into the larger constituent. Okay. So let's take a quick look at this. And then from there, we'll take a quick break because I can hear my dogs are starting to wake up. <laughs> so, you know, recording this, like having children recording this during naps, dog naps. <laughs> so at the initial stage, let's take the dog saw a man in the park. Okay. Again, an ambiguous sentence. Who's in the park? The dog, the man, both. Okay. So in theory, we could um, tag in the park, uh, modifying the dog or modifying the, the verb phrase. In constituency parsing, it doesn't matter quite as much because it's still part of the verb phrase very practically. Okay, but hold on to this idea. We're gonna use it some more. So the initial thing is to grab the whole sentence. Cool. Find the first noun phrase, dog. Find the first verb phrase, saw. Break that down. From there, we're pulling out the noun phrase as a determinant and a noun. And that's it for that noun phrase. Now this isn't on the leftmost side because it's not literally on the left, but the idea here is that you have, um, you've broken it all the way down until you get to a singular noun by itself. Okay. So it's the leftmost object in that branch, <laughs> so to speak. Um, it is not, uh, you know, an adjective phrase here, so to speak. From, uh, from here, we take the verb phrase and we start to break that down where the verb is the leftmost object. But then we got another noun phrase, right? A man. And um, cannot match man. That's that the man here. And that's really strange. Let's just say the dog. Very strange. Anyways, so uh, I've just noticed that like 600 years later. But like, so what happens is we get to our verb phrase, everything else. And we're like, well, crap. Got to break that down. First verb, cool. Now that after the verb, we got another noun phrase and a preposition phrase. So I can't leave it as a noun phrase. I got to break it down till I get to a singular noun. And so I broke that down on the determinant and noun. Can't leave it as a preposition phrase. Got to break it down till I get to a singular preposition. All right, preposition and a noun phrase. That's pretty normal. Okay, now I'm stuck with another noun phrase. So I got to break it down one more time. So the goal is to break down the sentence from these phrase structures, noun phrase, verb phrase, 
adjective phrases happen, prepositional phrases and adverb phrases are kind of the big ones. Um, until the very bottom of your phrase structure tree is the part of speech. Okay. So it breaks down and these are valid combinations. So underneath the hood, what's happening is that the grammar says, okay, a noun phrase can be a determinant and a noun. It could be a determinant and an adjective phrase, or it could be in this case, a noun phrase could be, um, well, this is a determinant and noun. A verb phrase can be just a verb, a verb and a noun phrase, oops, sorry. Um, a verb, a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase. So it, it allows for all of the valid combinations of what these phrases can break into. Okay. Now, we're gonna pause here so I can go feed my puppy dogs lunch. <laughs> and then we'll pick back up by doing some examples of these in Python and looking at some of the issues that one might have when we're working with, um, with these phrase structure trees.